some wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder thy power throughout the universe displayed then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art and when I think that God his son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art when christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Isn't He wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? have seen ears have heard it's recorded in God's word isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful let's pray All right.
times I give up, and He walks over me, then Jesus comes by, with words loud and strong, arise my child, it is I, I'm still on the
By the way things were looking, it seemed my ship would go down. The last thing I remember was kneeling to pray. Well, I guess that he heard my cry, for I'm still on my way. He brought me through, praise God, he brought me through. He's done everything my Lord said he would do. Possibilities, he's given victories, and he'll do the same for you. He brought me through. When feelings have given in to defeat And wisdom has told me I'd better retreat When the dearest of loved ones have tried but to no avail I'm glad there has been one precious friend who never has failed. He brought me through, praise God, he brought me through. He's done everything my Lord said he would do. Abilities. He's given victories And He'll do the same for you He brought me through And He'll do the same for you He brought me My message, I, I, I think it's going to be a two-parter. I think we'll have to finish the second part tonight. Uh, and I'm bringing my text from Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 through 18, and I'm entitling this, The Nations Were Angry. The Nations Were Angry. Heavenly Father, I pray your blessing upon the reading of your word, the study of your word, Thank you for being able to write a Bible that tells us what's ahead and that it's as it's, it's sure to happen as if it had already taken place. Thank you for the confidence we have in your word. Help us to go forward with great confidence and love for Christ. Looking forward to the day we see him face to face. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In Revelation chapter 11, <clears throat> Revelation and remember, it is revelation. It's not revelations. I get that out of the very first verse in the book of Revelation. It's only one revelation, and it says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. That's found in Revelation 1.1. And uh, the book of Revelation is revealing, it's a revelation of what's going to take place in the future. And... Primarily, it, it talks about the end times, and we often think of the book of Revelation with regard to the catastrophic events that's going to take place in the future. And we know that in those, in the, uh, from chapter 5 and 6 on, it talks about seven seal judgments, seven trumpet judgments, seven vials or bowl judgments. Interesting, seven is a very important number. 
in God's calendar. We'll mention that more later. But it talks about the various judgments that's coming upon the earth. And we want to talk about those because we know this is a sure thing. This is going to happen regardless of what the the New Green Deal says. The world's not going to end in 12 years, okay? (laughs) God's already spoken. Cortez, I don't care what she has to say. Uh, She hadn't read read her Bible, amen? So let's look at this. Revelation chapter 11, and my text will come out of Revelation chapter 11, verse 15 through 18, but let's look at verse 18 just very quickly. And the nations were angry. And thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give rewards unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and then that fear, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Now let me just make a passing comment about that last phrase going to destroy them which destroy the earth he's not talking and boy the green green people would love that and they may have already used it but it doesn't mean that that you dig holes in the planet okay doesn't mean that you've stomped on the dirt of the ground it's not talking about the the earth the ball of dirt at all it's talking about corrupting the people of the earth the planet the people that make up the earth How do we know that for sure? Because you compare Scripture with Scripture. Genesis chapter 6, verse 11, God speaks in Noah's day, and he says the earth was corrupt before him. Was the ball of dirt corrupt? No, the people were corrupt, and the earth was filled with violence. So God's going to destroy the people who have corrupted this planet, have corrupted other people. And there's multitudes out there in the corrupting business today. They're corrupting people constantly. They're, uh, boy, they're uh, messing with minds, the school systems involved in this, uh, an agenda to change people's, young people's thinking, to think in a certain fashion. And God says, I'm going to deal with all of that. There is coming a t- point in time, that I'm going to deal with all these issues. And I want to talk about that, if I might, this morning and tonight. Many people are curious about the future. Many times you watch the uh, History Channel or or some of these channels on TV, and they'll talk about future events. And there are some notables that they will refer to. Nostradamus is one. He lived back in 1503 to 1566. He's a French astrologer, physician, a reputed seer, who is best known for his collection of 942 poetic quatrains. Allegedly, the quatrains predict future events. His book was first published in 1555, and has rarely been out of print since his death. And they often refer to his writings, and they try to make his writings mean something which have a futuristic point to it. Another person that many of you remember was Jean Dixon. She used to make a lot of money prophesying the future. The Inquirer magazine, the Parade News magazine, would list her yearly predictions, and most were wrong, of course. However, she became one of the best-known American self-proclaimed psychics and astrologers of the 20th century because she did have a newspaper uh, uh, writings in it, astrology column, some well-publicized predictions, and she had a best-selling biography. However, she died in 1997. There's another individual of renown. His name is Edgar Cayce. He lived from 1877 to 1945. And he was an American clairvoyant who answered questions on subjects as varied as healings, reincarnation, wars, Atlantis, 
future events. While allegedly sleeping, he, he, uh, a biographer gave him the nickname the sleeping prophet. He would go into a, a sleep or a trance-like state, and then he would reveal these, these things that he saw. Um, and so his, his writings uh, are often uh, alluded to even today. However, the Bible has consistently been the most sought-after source for reliable prophetic truth. And, of course, why not? God wrote the book, and he wrote history before it became history. Aren't you glad you can rely upon the Bible? These other people are wrong. Now, whether they get some information from Satan, who's to say? But Satan is a liar anyway. So... <laughs> I want to get it from God who can The Bible says cannot lie. <coughs> and so if you're going to look into the future, I don't care what the politicians say, what's going to happen tomorrow or next year, five years from now. They don't know unless they got into the Bible and heard what God had to say about it. Because God wrote the Bible. Like I said, he wrote history before it became history. So in this portion of Scripture, God tells us of four very important prophetic truths that's going to take place in the very near future. So let's look at them. Number one, the Lord's returning to earth to reign forever. <coughs> in verse 15 through 17 of our text, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. One of the greatest prophetic truths that God has revealed to the inhabitants of the earth is that one day Jesus Christ is going to return from heaven and he's going to set up an eternal kingdom upon this earth. <clears throat> and he's going to reign supreme. His kingdom will be forever. Now it starts with a thousand years reign of peace and then at a later time he actually destroys this earth, recreates it, and continues his reign upon in the new heaven and new earth that he makes. But he's going to set up a kingdom. And when he begins to rule, he will rule forever. No one's ever going to take him off of the throne. He will be forever. Now Satan's going to be bound, and then he's going to be loose for a season. And Satan's going to try to amass a, an attack against Jesus Christ, which is fruitless, because Jesus is just going to destroy him, and he's going to reign forever and ever and ever. We know that. The Bible tells us that. God not only made a covenant with Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, but also with David, that there would be an everlasting kingdom that would be ruled by a descendant of David. Now, we can go back through these things, and I do want you to look at your Bibles a little bit today, but let me just quote this verse in 2 Samuel seven thirteen. Nathan the prophet is talking to David the king, and he's giving what, him what we call the Davidic covenant. And in 2 Samuel seven thirteen, he says, He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Now, the Davidic covenant refers to God's promise to David through Nathan the prophet. And he's giving him an unconditional covenant made between God and David where God promises David and Israel that the Messiah would come from the lineage of David, the tribe of Judah, would establish a kingdom that will endure forever and forever and forever. Now that's going to take place regardless of <coughs> all the fighting that goes on on this planet today. That's going to happen. Now the interesting thing about it is 
how close are we to getting there? You see, the Jewish people have always looked forward to the fulfillment of this promise that God made to both Abraham and David. They're going to get their land back. And it's more massive than what they have today. It's a promise. God made a promise. And he says, I'm not going to do it because just because of you. I'm doing it for me. I made a promise. I keep my promises. And the Jews are looking forward to that. They live for that moment. There's a lot they don't know about the Bible, but the one thing they do know is that God promised us a kingdom period where there would be no more oppression against us, no more crimes against us, no more hating us. It's going to be a beautiful period of time in Israel where the Jews come back to the land and they can live in peace and Jesus the Messiah will rule. They long for that moment, and rightly so. Now Jesus, when he was up on this earth, he gave a parable in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. And it alludes to that. He says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all his holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations. He shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on the right hand, the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The Jews understand that. They long for that moment. Whenever they have an opportunity to see Jesus, Jesus, when are you going to set up your kingdom? Tell me, how close are we to it? And as you get into the book of Revelation, you find that the kingdom that they're looking forward to has a thousand-year reign of peace. Like I say, at the end of that, Satan will be loosed and, and there will be some more turmoil, but God's going to dispense with all that as well. So back in our text, in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, the seventh angel sounded and said there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. How close are we to that taking place? Well, it's interesting if you get into the news today. The nation of Israel is currently, right now, as of today, looking for the coming Messiah to set up his kingdom and his throne in Jerusalem. Very recently, some prominent Jewish rabbis, Rabbi Berland and Rabbi Berdani, have stated that they believe the Messiah will appear this year. 2019. That's 5779 on the Hebrew calendar. Matter of fact, they go, they go beyond that. They say that they believe he will appear this month, month of April, and that he will appear by April 19th. These are very, very prominent Jewish rabbis. Now, the important thing about their comments is not so much the exact date, which, you know, Jesus could come any time, but as far as the Messiah, their Messiah showing up, it will not happen. But the fact is that they're sincere in thinking that the coming Messiah is imminent. That's what's important. I'm saying to you right now, the day in which we live, this month, this day, they are feverishly, looking for the return of the Messiah to set up their kingdom. Now, according to Jewish writings, the Messiah must meet certain conditions. And surprisingly, the Messiah will not necessarily be identified by his ability to perform earth-shattering miracles. In fact, he isn't required to perform any miracles at all even though we know the Antichrist will.
but he must study the Torah and observe its uh, commandments. He must influence other Jews to follow the Torah. He will wage the battles of God or he'll fight battles for Israel. He must be a direct descendant of the, the, the Davidic dynasty and he will help rebuild the temple in Jerusalem and gather Jews from all over the world and bring them back into the land of Israel. All the nations, they say, will recognize the Messiah to be a world leader and will accept his dominion as there will be world peace, no more wars, nor famines, and in general, a high standard of living. This is what they believe about the coming Messiah. Now, unfortunately, this is a picture that the Bible paints of the Antichrist, which is fascinating. The Antichrist must come and appear before Jesus can set up his kingdom. And what they don't realize is that they're now prepared to accept the Antichrist when they, in fact, did not accept Jesus Christ the first time. The first time they rejected the true Messiah, who was, in fact, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. They didn't accept it. He did miracles. They couldn't, they couldn't dispute Jesus' power. They couldn't dispute what his wisdom. And yet they rejected him. This time, they'll not do that. They're going to receive anybody that makes the appearance, or at least gives the appearance of the Messiah. Jesus even predicted that. He says in John 5, 43, I am come in my Father's name, and you received me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. Now, they're looking for the Messiah right now. Whoever comes as a world leader and is able to meet these certain conditions, they're happy to declare him their Messiah. Which tells us how close we are come, coming to the appearance of the Antichrist. You see, the Antichrist must appear before the Jews can set up the kingdom. And we'll tell you why in just a moment, as why there must be a tribulation period. However, what's happening in Jerusalem today is really the preparation for the return of the Lord. And we're living in unusual times. President Donald Trump has come up on the scene and he's doing for Israel what no other president would do. He's recently recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And even more recently has moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. He also has now declared that it's time for the United States to fully recognize Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights. No other president dared do this. President Trump is also working feverishly to put together a Middle East peace agreement that he calls the deal of the century. Donald Trump's presidency very well, very, may very well be God's sovereignty at work, bringing about the end time setup of Israel, preparing it for the coming kingdom period. In other words, I'm saying through our current president and his association with Israel, it is allowing Israel to get closer and closer and closer to... Uh, looking for the Messiah, rebuilding the temple, getting back to the sacrificial uh, services, um, looking for the, uh, the kingdom period. And it's all happening right now. They now have the red heifer. They need a red heifer. They need a perfect red heifer. And by that I mean they have to have a red heifer that doesn't, it cannot have one hair that's not red. It can't have a white hair. They now have that. 
for the first time since the animal sacrifices of old. They now have the red heifer. Why do they need a red heifer? Because in order to, to dedicate the temple, they have to slay the red heifer, spread his ashes, and do what they do as a sacrifice for the dedication of the temple. They now have that. They've made all the instruments for the temple. They have all the gowns, all the garments. They're putting together the Levites. I mean, it's all set up. And now, politically, the President of the United States is allowing the world to move in a different position whereby they very well could soon be allowed to rebuild the temple that they so want to build. So why does God need a seven-year period of tribulation? Why before the kingdom period, that thousand years reign of peace where Jesus rules and reigns, all the Jews are back into their land, they're, they're prospering, they're being blessed of God. Why from this point to that point is there a need for this terrible, terrible seven-year period of destruction Destruction upon this planet. Let me give you three reasons that I believe that's necessary. And you might turn in your Bibles, Isaiah 13, 9. Number one, God's going to punish the inhabitants of this earth for their sins and their rebellion. It's going to happen. <clears throat> We in America, if you're living for God at all, you understand you're living by God's grace. You don't, you, 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 matter of fact, you question why God has been as good to America as he has. Because America has been getting worse and worse and worse toward God. God is going to judge sin. Isaiah chapter 13 verse 9 Notice how it begins, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. That's the tribulation he's talking about, this seven-year period of time. Both cruel and wrath, uh, a cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Now notice, and I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease. And I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. God says, I am finally going to bring my wrath down upon the sin of this world. You cannot reject Jesus Christ and mock God and get away with it. God says, I'm going to judge that all over the planet. As the planet has become more and more corrupt, and by that I mean the people of the planet, God says, I'm going to bring my wrath down on it, and I am going to judge the sins of this, these people. So God has to, because there's a side to God, we always hear about God's love and God's mercy. But God being God has to be a God of justice as well. And he says, I am going to bring justice down. And sin has to be judged. The wages of sin is death. And God says, is this what you want? This is what you're going to get. And if you'll read the different judgments in the book of Revelation, they are devastating. The grass is burned up. The trees are burned up. The oceans and the streams turn to blood. I mean, there's plagues. There's darkness. And then there's one point where the sun uh, is increased by sevenfold. The people are scorched. I'm saying God takes all of the elements and he says, I'm going to punish this world because of their sins. It's coming. I don't have to care about Edgar Casey or Nostradamus. I don't care what they say. It's coming, and you can see these prophetic events start lining up, especially when their leading rabbis say, I think the Messiah might come this month. 
And in God's timetable, anything can happen overnight. The second reason that there's going to be a tribulation period, not only is God just and he's going to punish the inhabitants of the earth because of their sins, secondly, it's to humble Israel so that they will repent of their sin, of rejecting Jesus Christ as Messiah, and finally acknowledge him as their Lord and Savior. God, he has to put them through the fires of punishment to even get them to admit they're wrong and ask for forgiveness and receive the true Messiah as their Savior. They're a stubborn people. That's why it's hard to win a Jew to Jesus Christ today. Why they don't listen to the New Testament. Their eyes are blind. They, in their mind, have an idea of what the Messiah will look like when he comes. And Satan is going to give them a false Messiah, and they're going to fall for it. That's two mistakes. The third one will not be a mistake. They refuse to accept Christ at the beginning. This time they're going to accept the wrong one. But the third time, when they see him coming in the sky. Well, let's look at the verse of Scripture. Zechariah in your, in your Bible, the Old Testament, at the end of the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Here's what God says. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now he's talking about the Jewish people. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that, it is, that is in bitterness for his firstborn. There'll be a day after such punishment. They think they're going to be totally annihilated during this tribulation period in the Antichrist and, and the, the, the battle of Armageddon and all that goes on during this terrible time, and they're being killed and ravished. They're going to cry out as they did in, back in Egypt, Oh God, oh God, have mercy upon us. And all of a sudden, Jesus is going to return to set up his kingdom. And they'll see him with his scars in his hands. And they will mourn because they realize the mistake they made. They crucified their Messiah and they will mourn and weep and repent of their mistake. But they will accept him as, they, as he comes and fights their battles for him. And they're going to win. And Jesus is going to set up that kingdom that he promised them thousands of years ago. And he says, this land's yours and I'm going to rule. This is going to be, Jerusalem is going to be the religious the, the spiritual and governmental capital of the world. And Jesus is going to sit on the throne and he will rule and reign. And the Jews will accept him as their Messiah. But in order to get them to get to that point, they have to go through such suffering to break their proud hearts. And it requires all of that pain to humble them. Pain humbles us today. It's unfortunate we become, can become so proud that God allows such pain to come into our lives to strip us from that pride and to humble us and say, well, God, I'm so sorry. I need you. I can't help myself. And God says, now I'm, you're where I can do something with you. Let me give you one more scripture with regard to what God's going to do with Israel in Ezekiel, if you can find it, Ezekiel 36. God, once again, through the prophet Ezekiel, talks about the time when he comes back. What's he going to do with the Jewish people? In Ezekiel 36, 22. <clears throat> Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, 
Ezekiel, here's what I want you to tell Israel. Ezekiel 36, 24. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Verse 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean. And from your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. And ye shall be my people. And I will be your God. They want that. And God says that through all that suffering, you're now willing to accept Christ as your Savior. And you're humble enough now that God can cleanse you and forgive you as you cry and you mourn over your sins. And ask for forgiveness. God says, I'll put a new heart in you. I will cleanse you. I will forgive you. I will be your God. You will be my people. And you're going to see the conversion of the Jewish population. It's going to be remarkable. But the tribulation is needed in order to accomplish that. And thirdly, it's simply to cleanse the world so that Jesus can, in fact, take possession and set up a kingdom of righteousness. He has to destroy the wicked out of it. He's going to get rid of all the wicked. Boy, if you're not saved, you better give your life to Christ. The wicked are going to be destroyed. The righteous are going to go into the kingdom period, whether you're the redeemed or God's dealing with the Jews. However, only those that trust Christ and believe in Christ and accept him as the Messiah are going to go into the, into the, the kingdom period. It's because it's, it's, a, it's a kingdom of righteousness. Now, there'll be people in their earthly bodies, and we'll get more into that. The redeemed will have our incorruptible bodies. We'll serve and rule and reign with him. <coughs> but the Lord, that's when he, remember a passage I read in Matthew where he comes again, and we'll come back with him. And the inhabitants of this earth, he says, I, I separate them. I put my sheep on one side. I put the goats on the other. In other words, those that trust me, those are on that side. Those that don't are on that side. The sheep, he says, come on in. He says, this has been prepared for you for the kingdom from the foundation of the world. The goats, you're gone. You're not a part of it. You're out. You're through. There's no begging. There's nothing you can do. It's it. When Jesus comes and he sets up this kingdom, and it will last a thousand years, he's going to rule the earth with a rod of iron and in righteousness. That scares a lot of Christians today. Righteousness? You mean I have to live righteously? Absolutely. But then again, if you're really a believer, you want to live righteously. See, a lot of, a lot of so-called Christians are afraid of heaven. Man, you know, I can't sin up there. If you still want to sin, you've got a problem. Revelation 19.15 says, And out of his mouth goeth forth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He treadeth the winepress of the fiercest of the wrath of Almighty God. It will be a land of righteousness. Jesus setting up on the throne in Jerusalem. The Jews will be back into their land. It's all theirs. 
All the promises that God promised them from the very beginning will be theirs. What's wonderful about that period of time, if you want to look at the verses or write them down, it's going to be a time of peace. There'll be no more wars. Isaiah 2.4 talks about it. Isaiah was a great prophet. Ezekiel was a great prophet. Daniel was a great prophet. You got those three great prophets, and then some of the minor prophets added to it, but Isaiah talked often about it. Ezekiel, Daniel, of course, the book of Revelation. Isaiah 2 4 says, And he shall judge among the nations. He shall rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. God will not permit it. There's no more war. Why? Because he says, this is it. This is how it's done. In Isaiah eleven six, 6, it says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. Can you imagine that? The curse is lifted. They learn war no more. It's amazing that these animals that thrive on each other will lie down in peace together. It's wonderful in Jesus Christ. That's why he's called the Prince of Peace. He is the origin of peace. Like I said, it will be the period of time is a thousand years. That's why we call it the millennium. And also what makes it wonderful is that Satan will be bound in hell during this period of time. In Revelation 23, 20 verse 3, God says, I'll cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, set a seal upon him, that's Satan, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Thousand years, Satan will not tempt you again, or anybody upon this planet. Don't you get tired of fighting Satan? The Bible says he does one thing. He seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. He hates you. He hates anything of God. If you're his children, he hates you. Hates the cause of God. He hates the Bible. All he, he lives simply to attack God and God's cause. And so you can expect, if you're living a Christian life, to be attacked by Satan. One of these days, that will all be behind you. You won't have to fight him anymore. You see, I want you to know, and I want the world to know, that Satan is a loser. Why in the world would the occult thrive? Why would people look to Satanism and the occult and the New Agers and the psychics and the demonics? Why would they look to them for answers when, in fact, they're all funded, so to speak, by Satan, who is a loser? And he'll take you to hell with him. That's exactly what Satan wants to do. And I look around and I see people following him all the time. The Jews will enjoy the kingdom promised to them for so long. Along with the Gentiles that have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We will rule and reign with Christ. Of course, prior to the tribulation and the rule of the Antichrist, the children of God will be removed from the earth in the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, Then they which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. It's interesting, there's controversy over that as to when the rapture will take place. The word caught up comes from the Greek word harpazo, 
which means to seize or to carry off by force. Paul used it sparingly in his writings. The Greek word is only used 13 times in the New Testament. Only two times is the word ever used to deal with the saints of God being caught up to God. It's never used when Jesus comes back to this earth and separating the, the, the people on the earth. It's never used in Matthew with regard to the return of the Lord as he's talking to the Jews. The, the few times, and you can look it up, uh, you remember the verse where it says, Paul was caught up into the third heaven? That's Harpazo, taken by force. Recall where uh, Philip was... Uh, ministering to the Ethiopian eunuch, leading him to Christ. The Bible says that the Spirit caught him away. Parpazo took him suddenly away. So it's used in people being removed from a situation very suddenly, but never used with regard to being caught up to heaven, except in a couple of verses. It's never used about Jesus coming back and, and taking the people at that time. Why? Because the Bible says that the rapture is a mystery. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We're going to be caught away, and people don't understand it. But the fact is, the Lord loves his bride, and he's going to take us home where we do not have to face this tribulation period or the Antichrist or the mark of the beast. I've known good pastors who say, well, we're training our people to be able to face the Antichrist and reject the mark of the beast. And How can you train somebody? to reject the mark of the beast. That's saying you can do it within your own power. We stand by God's grace every day, and I want you to know that. Amen. And I've questioned these people often. Do you believe you can turn down the mark of the beast? Yeah, yeah. Really, you're that strong. Do you think 100% of Christians can say no to the Antichrist? Well, I don't know. Well, I have to. If you're a Christian, you can't take the mark of the beast. Or else God broke his promise in giving you everlasting life. You need to understand this doctrinally. A Christian who is saved is saved eternally. You cannot not by your own power. You cannot or you violate the very doctrine of the Bible. You bring into question God's word. How many Christians accepted the mark of the beast? Because once you accept that, you go to the lake of fire. And God promises never to lose one of his sheep. Amen. And he will not put you in that position. It's by his grace he's going to take care of you. He will protect you. I don't protect myself. I'm unable to protect myself. Thank God for his grace. And that's why he says, I'm going to do it by force. <laughs> I'm going to snatch you out of this old world. Do it for you. And then I'm going to... I'm going to then I'm, the, the judgment's coming, and I'm going to purge this old world of its sin. They love their sin so much, then here's what you get. Here's your payday. I find it also interest, interesting that Jesus says when he returns, he returns with the saints. They're already with him. Matter of fact, Jude 1.14, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, 
saying, Behold, behold the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. How can he come with them if they're never got, had they've never gotten there? Zechariah 14.5, And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. Zechariah 14.5. Revelation 19.14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. What's that? It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We're coming back with him. I'll stay in the